Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, um, welcome to the new school. Um, I am Karen Cohn. I'm the director of the Verlis Centre for Art and Politics, and really delighted to present to you tonight um, this event called Post Democracy uh, Paradise Lost. And um, I'd like to urge you to maybe come a little closer. We're keeping this as a very informal meeting and an opportunity to meet and be introduced to the Verily Center Fellows, Casey Golan and Victoria Sobel. And I'm sorry, you had a question? Mm -hmm. Put the microphone by your mouth. Yes. Pick it up a bit, I have trouble oh, okay, okay, absolutely. Um, so I just want to give you a bit of a sense of the context in which these fellowships happen. Um, uh, they uh, they um, develop over the course of two years. The Verily Center um, is at the New School. We are we like to think of ourselves as the um, kind of public platform where scholarship becomes uh, policy, where the intersection of art and politics is continuously investigated. And we do so through curatorial focus themes that probe and look at one issue over the course of two years in depth and in a variety of different um, constellations and initiatives. I think it's fair to say that the key initiative um, in relationship to our topic, the curatorial topic, is the fellowship program. Because different from our regular events and exhibitions and conferences, the fellows accompany the development of these programs around the theme for um, often up to two years. Um, we therefore take you know, great pride in um, having fellows with us, and we also take great care to find the absolutely uh, perfect match. And I think um, this year it's, um, we've just been extremely lucky once again by having Victoria Sobel and Casey Golan join us for a series of programs on post-democracy. Um, what we also try to do with these themes is identify a um, line of inquiry or a theme or a topic that is of broad resonance in you know, society outside the new school that has um, uh, a sense of urgency and is um, a topic that should be discussed at that one moment. Uh, so through this desire to, con to connect with what's out there happening in the political or the, you know, the non-academic or even the non-artistic world, we come up with themes such as post-democracy. Um, that term itself was coined by a British uh, political scientist and it refers to our conditions in Western society where the um, validity and the legitimacy and the importance of the electoral system as it is organized in uh, our democracies is at the very least questioned if it, not, if it has not actually been even um, uh, recognized as being uh, no longer of um, significance. Um, post-democracy or paradise lost, I would think, refers to that aspect of um, the theme of post-democracy. At the same time, of course, through a number of different reasons, we see an enormous growth in transnational solidarity movements, in um, exchanges amongst groups of people who are aligned through shared contact, uh, co shared uh, goals and agendas and um, um, issues completely beyond and trans, uh, transcending national uh, borders. That sense of urgency that we see um, associated with Western democracy is matched by a deep rethinking of what it means to be an educational institution, whether it's a private one, such as the new school, or whether it's a public one, such as the Verilis Center, which is part of the new school, but always presenting everything that is created at the center uh, for free to the general public, very much in the desire to bridge that, um, you know, that what is often referred to as a gap uh, between academia and, and um, the outside world. At the same time, also because um, the center is um, turning 25, next year, we need to reflect not just on our ed own educational mission, but also on the structure of an institution such as ours, which is um, uh, very successful, um, well-connected, um, works along different kinds of networks, and therefore possibly reflective of how organizations as align themselves with different issues in a actually surprisingly contemporary way, given the fact that we are 25 years old. 
all of this to say that um, Casey and Victoria's project uh, came just at the right moment when we were trying to figure out where the Verily Center is as an institution, as an education institution, and what it means to be um, in solidarity with other um, organizations or movements or groups of artists throughout the world. Um, your project um, was one of, I think, over 130 that uh, were submitted for a fellowship. And out of this pool coming from 25 different countries, eventually um, your project and another one by Lawrence Abdu Abu Hamdan, who is based in Beirut and will join us in November, was selected as the two projects that we're going to commit to for the next two years and um, try our very best to support you in um, everything you will take us to. <laughs> um, and so this is the first you know, public uh, presentation or opportunity for you to encounter um, Casey and Victoria. And um, it's really lovely to have quite a few um, students here, also teachers and professors. We're continuing the conversations within the new school with our um, professors and classes. And you, and you're going to speak in a couple of classes. There's a faculty lunch and so on. So um, this is a, um, yeah, uh, an opportunity I'm very grateful uh, for because it allows us in a more intimate uh, circle to begin to find out um, where you will sp spend the next two years as part of this fellowship. Um, your biography is really quite long and not just because there are two of you. <laughs> so maybe I'll just refer you to the, pr uh, to the program where it's uh, listed in details. And um, the idea is that we'll have a presentation by you for about 45 minutes. And then, of course, we hope you will all join us in the conversation that follows. Thank you both very much. And thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, and I think we both want to thank the uh, VLC Advisory Committee for helping us along and helping put this uh, event together tonight. Uh, I think that we are going to start off our 45 minutes. Uh, it's a multimedia presentation, and I think we're going to do, be doing a little bit of explaining uh, of the project that we submitted to the Verilis Center, but also talking about some of these additional events that are coming. In putting together this presentation, we considered that actually the future encounters that Karen mentioned might deviate a bit from uh, the type of work that Casey and I have both previously been known for doing uh, at Cooper Union, where we're both uh, School of Art graduates from the class of 2013. Uh, I also feel very thankful to everyone who came out tonight. I know it's early in the semester, and also uh, that it is still the end of summer, and there are many different events that are going on right now, but we thought it would actually be a nice uh, punctuation or rather a point of public record to come out here and talk a little bit about what has led us to the Verilis Center, what these new types of engagements might be and how some of our previous work will continue to inform them. Um, and so with that, I think that we'll just start.
so we'll return to uh, the content of this video a little bit later in the presentation, but I thought it'd be nice to open with it so that when we come back around, maybe you'll have an aha moment the way we did. Uh, so in putting together this presentation, we began to rehash a lot of previous presentations we've given on the subject of Cooper Union, Free Cooper Union, uh, student activism, governance, and now post-democracy, and we, like, like many times, we started at square one, which looks a bit like this, uh, which is to say a bit like nothing, and we weren't sure whether to uh, sort by chronology, sort by events, sort by reflections, and... Uh, We're and also really bad at giving talks, basically, so we got really nervous, and... Uh, we started like showing this zoom in of sweating from December, uh, which is, that was around the time that we found out that we got the fellowship and Karen came and asked uh, a really nice question about institutional time and, uh, <laughs> but basically we were uh, on the verge of a breakdown, but we've had a chance to give a couple different talks since then and uh, so today we are kind of merging different aspects of what we do, some of it is about ideas that we're working through. Some of it is about projects we've done, and some of it is about Cooper Union and the history there. And so in, in uh, we're about to get to our proposal, uh, but actually in conjunction to the proposal that we submitted to the, the Vera List Center, we actually took on an additional, uh, an additional sort of event planning that, that we had initially thought would consist of a number of panels, but we began to ask ourselves who we might invite to these panels, who might attend these panels, and what could be gained from such a panel format, uh, especially given how much event, how many events go on throughout the city. Uh, so instead, we've kind of rethunk these, this panel format uh, to be actually four events, this being the first. Great. So uh, we discovered the sort of call for post-democracy uh, last summer, and we looked on Wikipedia and found a checklist. <laughs> and we basically checked seven boxes that indicate that Cooper Union, uh, where we went to college, is extremely emblematic of post-democracy. Uh, and colleges are, are particularly, it seems, subject to this kind of smoke and mirrors of something that is about improving lives and changing the world and uh, but it's actually some of the most like rotten stuff going on like colleges are real estate companies and they're launching like MFA programs and in institutional critique and uh, it's it's just really bad so that's we checked all the boxes and we proposed uh, some work that we wanted to do in the coming year Perhaps we should have started with this slide, but this is gonna give you a brief overview if you haven't heard about Cooper Union or what's been going on at Cooper Union. Uh, Cooper Union is a college for art, architecture, and engineering founded in 1859 by Peter Cooper to provide free education to the working classes of New York City. In the past several decades, the college has become unrecognizably corporatized, charging tuition for the first time in its history in 2014. We have been organizing in opposition to this since 2011, our larger project. We're post-fallout roaches. We're young alumni and students on a countdown clock to zero institutional memory. Our involvement is not officially recognized, but we've stuck around because we've, we have unfinished business. What keeps us here is both vague and crystal clear. Something, some fling. We hear it across institutions, this placeholder for a deep sense of purpose that defies language, unhinging ourselves. To contend with financialized worldviews, we turn to patophores. It takes language twice removed to escape arguments that we aren't trying to have. Anti-aspirationality. Brainwashed to innovate, we turn instead to the joy of patient work. Breath-based organizing in close proximity and high intensity pushes back against insurmountable odds. Sunset clause midwifery. We don't identify as artists, activists, or academics, but people trying to create space, time, and proximity towards shaping a community-led institution, um, which led actually to our project which involved a series of, of meetings, in just institutional exchanges, research, programming such as this, publications and interventions. Um, and if you haven't already, at the end, I, I, I hope you'll pick up uh, this Reflections publication that we put out on the table. It's free and please take multiple and give them to anyone who you think might be interested in 
the content of what we're talking about tonight. This was a first reflections that we put out in December. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's copies over there, but we also have some of the yellow, which we put out last week. And then this is uh, kind of a first in a second of three. <laughs> So just as Casey said, we've been talking a lot about reflections, this idea about reflecting while in motion. And as we were applying uh, to the Verilist Fellowship, we had to think a lot about what it meant to be interfacing with not only another institution, but one whose who, who's different aspects, whether it's financial, architectural, like pedagogical uh, qualities, are somewhat similar, not only in proximity to Cooper's, but also just in terms of curriculum or student body or uh, quality of education. And so we began to think about what that might look like uh, in a longer term. We had also just come back from a trip to Antioch College in the middle of Ohio, uh, which felt kind of random uh, to drive like 18 hours or something to Ohio. Uh, but we actually went twice that summer uh, because we had found out that they had undergone a really similar kind of political breakdown, like the one that happened at Cooper. And specifically, the alumni at Antioch decided to continue the teaching and the learning, even without the institution itself. So they literally went bankrupt, shut down, vacated the buildings, and the school kind of lived on in like church basements and they got like a little headquarters in the town. Um, so we basically drove out there and stood in the middle of like uh, their quad on reunion weekend and like waited for someone to come talk to us. And over the course of those two trips, we ended up meeting like just a ton of people who brought us super deeply into their lives and uh, we basically took back this one word, which is nonstop. And nonstop refers to the community as it was in exile during the years that Antioch College was closed by its administration. And so having gone back, uh, as Casey mentioned, we actually happened to time our trip uh, to coincide with the first graduating class's commencement. And this was rather significant because they were, as, as a cohort, they were the first scholars to repopulate this, uh, this, in a way, decrepit campus that had been left unattended for the years that it was closed because the community was actually not allowed to be on uh, the property. And a lot of these different qualities that had to do with the physicality of the building, this space, the way that everything was laid out, uh, and this idea of identifying with a, a community being in exile reminded us a lot, a lot of other institutions, not only our own, the new school, CUNY, um, and a few that we're going to talk about. This was uh, like chasing the president of Antioch wearing the suit. Like we were literally running after him to try to uh, pick his brain, but he wouldn't take a meeting with us despite many emails. This was also another school that we were looking at at the time. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with USC Roski. Um, it's a grad program in California and the entire class dropped out simultaneously. And uh, it's kind of the inverse of nonstop Antioch because the institution kept going without any students. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. In solidarity at the time, um, a, a number of us began to issue statements that reflected uh, the kind of the entanglement of these different situations, whether it be USC Roski or Antioch or Cooper or Bard College, there happened to be kind of a growing amount in this coming kind of around 2012, 2013 was following, which we'll talk about soon, the coattails of occupying a lot of larger uprisings that had to do a lot with institutional critique. And so it seemed, it seemed right at the time to continue to make these points of public record about the moment so as not to let them pass. So I'm going to try to do our fastest and most concise talk about the history of Cooper ever, um, because I am just continually finding out more and more. And it's an impossibly deep and complex history that's completely intertwined with New York City politics and real estate and technology. Um, it basically continues to shock me all the time. But this is Cooper Union Foundation Building. It is uh, in the East Village at Astor Place. When it was built, it was, I think, the tallest building in the area, uh, if not the city. 
Um, this is another shot of it. You can see that today the whole thing is a college, but originally there was retail on the ground floor, and uh, over time it became this uh, this educational institution that's now in the metal building you saw before that looks a lot like new schools, but it was founded, uh, I think Victoria mentioned, by Peter Cooper, a philanthropist, industrialist, and it was founded for the working class. This is the Great Hall where pretty much every president has spoken. A lot of really important civic debates have happened here through history. Significantly, there really wasn't a place in the city where these debates could be had. They were outside of the city's purview, and I think it was in Peter Cooper's uh, desire to create multiple spaces within under one under one roof in which people could come in, uh, talk to each other, argue, uh, hear each other out. This is a image called a heckler in the Great Hall at Cooper Union. Um, I can't read the year, but it's it's from a long time ago. But it's basically still like this. They do the like rent board hearings there every year, so um, there's still a lot of heckling. And this is about uh, Peter Cooper's kind of deep entanglement in the city. You probably recognize the main branch of the New York Public Library. Significantly, Cooper's library actually predated New York having a public library system. So Cooper's library, which still exists today, was the first place that you could come and read. Um, and it, it has a lot of those firsts throughout history, but even before the New York Public Library was a library, we found out also around this time last year, it was an above ground reservoir and Peter Cooper was just involved in almost everything infrastructurally at the time. So this was uh, bringing water down from the Croton Reservoir and storing it in uh, Midtown. So this was drained to create that branch of the library. And probably many of you having walked around the Lower East Side uh, will notice that there are other areas, Cooper Square, uh, Peter Cooper in, I think it's, is it Park in Stuyvesant, around Stu uh, like Stuyvesant area. That Peter, Cooper, Peter Cooper's family and, the, and his uh, kind of, his family that married in the Hewitts uh, were very involved uh, on the municipal level of the city having a lot to do with the day-to-day -day happenings, political and otherwise, but they also had their own private uh, desires. And again, I think we're, we'll talk, I'll talk about Peter Cooper soon. Uh, he was also involved with a lot of communications infrastructure. So uh, early sort of infrastructure for the telegrams, uh, telegraph and undersea cables connecting uh, continents. So this is like, just amazing looking. And I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very striking image, essentially. The transatlantic cable is kind of a shocking thing to think that Peter Cooper would have had a hand in making because from a young age, he was unable to obtain a higher education, having uh, inherited a large sum of debt from his father. Uh, having to kind of create and innovate on his own, he invented things like uh, Jello and and different uh, hide hide-based glues, and from there, his desire to learn more kind of took him into uh, creating such things like the I-beam and the rolled steel, which creates a lot of, like Casey said, the infrastructure, which allowed for a future, uh, future infrastructure technologies such as the transatlantic cable and the telegraph to be made. And so from this kind of very small view of New York City, you kind of this new expansive and, uh, and even global uh, realm was kind of being tapped into even in the 1850s uh, for better or worse. So these cables are now like every everything gets repurposed and this is like the modern day internet still somehow. So. And uh, an interesting thing to have sort of thought about is how the world kind of changed around Cooper. So this is the first annual report showing where the students came from uh, professionally. And you can see that it has like melodeon makers, um, like uh, pen makers, just all kinds of uh, jobs, which are, it feels like now the biggest employers are like multinational corporations and like Target or McDonald's or something. So. These were the types of students that Cooper was taking in. 
So I, having, having both kind of come out of the school around uh, 2013, I actually entered into Cooper Union in the School of Art in 2008. Um, that is, many of you will remember, right around the time of the, the recession. And uh, a lot of college students, myself included, were hit quite hard. It seemed, uh, it seemed logical to go to college. I remember most of my peers deciding to still go. It didn't seem like something to take into account. And uh, Cooper, for its part, was actually undergoing uh, an immense rebranding uh, under, it, under an administration that was in close proximity to a board which had been kind of uh, shuffling through for basically many decades. Uh, the Wall Street Journal published an article in 2009, which I remember seeing uh, as a freshman, called One College Sidesteps the Crisis. Um, as many endowments suffer, no tuition Cooper Union builds and basks. And I think it was, uh, I think it was part of the board's agenda to create a media narrative that, uh, that kind of a like an affluent style building and a new way of looking at things, which is actually still quite a prevalent trend in higher education today. Was, uh, was a way to go and that they could bolster this idea by using the media, not necessarily by having, uh, having a plan in place. Um, this, of course, preceded Occupy Wall Street, which came in 2011. Uh, this, is an, this is a picture of Zuccotti Park from the top side of Broadway. Um, I wanted to show this in counterpoint to the lavishness of the Wall Street Journal article just because they, in my mind, they stand out in stark contrast. Both the, 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 the reality and the unreality of both uh, having happened. Um, it's right out of the shot of the photo, but right on the left hand side is uh, the office of uh, the chairman of our current <laughs> board of trustees uh, right on Wall Street. But I actually participated uh, for a long time, basically the entire encampment at Occupy Wall Street, and it was a time in which, uh, which informed a lot of future occupations, uh, including the one that just happened at City Hall Park, um, which kind of created a, a sense of uh, necessary disruption and intervention within the city, it created a culture of um, marches that have happened for any, any number of causes which have become so necessary these days. Um, and then the next slide, uh, this is the tent that I <laughs> lived in for two months, right, uh, right on the park. I worked a lot with the media group, so if any of you use current like live streaming technology, um, that was kind of pioneered uh, in a way that reminds me a bit of Peter Cooper and the Transatlantic Cable by a group of media activists that had just come back from M15 in Spain uh, and had been doing a lot of work to get media kits, particularly things that were uh, producing live streamable technology using laptops and external batteries and web cameras uh, to countries and people and organizers who were facing severe, um, severe repression under different uh, legal constructs. So they brought that to the park and I think that that's something I've taken away and it's something that we later used uh, in Free Cooper. And basically, when I met Victoria, I was in a class on censorship at Cooper, and I heard that there was this Cooper person at the park doing whatever. And so I like emailed her to see if she would like speak to my class about um, Occupy and live streaming and stuff, and she didn't uh, respond to my email. <laughs> this, is, uh, this was so. I think the w <laughs> an interesting takeaway was that despite despite the park and, and the entire Occupy Wall Street movement trying to create its own shadow or independent media, we were still kind of facing these many different layers of counter media through the mainstream and otherwise. Uh, I found this article a few years, a few years ago. Uh, one is, uh, one I believe is a Huffington Post article. I was doing a lot of work to set up like the financial infrastructure, not only for the New York City occupation, but also across the country, uh, which kind of set up a network of fiscally sponsored uh, occupations in which people could kind of give tax deductibly to help support these uh, the people who were in the park. Uh, the one on the the one on your right um, ties me to Joseph Stieglitz, who this blogger uh, thought went to Cooper Union, and somehow all of the donation, the cash donations, were somehow in this huge conspiracy. The one from the Huffington Post alleges that we were collecting cash to buy vegan pizzas. So, um, you know, but these are, these are, on the internet, these are things that are lasting, uh, lasting pieces of text. So it's nice to grapple with. And basically back at Cooper, uh, the year that Victoria was 
away was basically when uh, all hell broke loose and the administration had announced that the college was actually in a ton of debt and might have to consider charging tuition for the first time in its history. Um, but they did it in a way that was very plausibly deniable for them. So they insisted for basically years that they would only charge tuition as a last resort. And that led a lot of the community to uh, into very kind of false participatory roles, like countless task forces and working groups and uh, sort of feasibility studies for both cutting costs and generating revenue. Um, but as students, we started to just have a bad feeling about it all, that they were essentially um, running down the clock and running out the money until they would get to take an easy way out of charging tuition. So a group of students started to meet kind of at nighttime to put together some way of calling attention to the situation that would escalate it from sort of simple walkouts and letters to the editor um, and kind of hopefully galvanize people. So uh, that's around the time that Victoria came back and basically with a ton of resources and skills from having worked at Occupy. Yeah, well, the latent, the latent network of people were quite dissatisfied with the eviction from the park and went on to work in just so many different campaigns that are still very present, uh, I would say, just constantly, whether they're cop watches in small neighborhoods, uh, Occupy Sandy, just so many different types of skill sets were funneled back into uh, more localized campaigns, including our own. Uh, what was interesting was that having come back into Cooper in, around 2012, uh, this, had, this was following the $1 trillion debt day, which was a, a large student-led protest during the Occupy kind of moment. And then also in, in the midst of NYU's like very large expansion plan, there was a lot going on and there was a huge dissatisfaction nationally with the level of student debt. So there was a lot that we thought that as a, as a group of students, there was a lot that everyone agreed this this could com contribute to the dialogue. It could really be pivotal for people to, to assess the situation differently. Um, so a lot of times we show a ton of stuff that happened in these years because it was basically full of people getting together to come up with different ways to disrupt the administration and to call attention. Um, but today we're going to show like four minutes of a clip from the movie Ivory Tower, which is a documentary by Andrew Rossi. Uh, that surveys the state of American uh, private higher education. And uh, I think, or private and public, yeah, but both. Um, yeah. After 18 months of intense analysis, the Board of Trustees voted last week to charge tuition for all undergraduates admitted to Cooper Union, beginning with the class of 2014. Right after the announcement was made, I spoke to Jamshed. Jamshed was, you know, waving his hands, yelling, cutting us off. Right outside of the school, there was a lot of grieving. People were angry. You could kind of feel this chaotic energy. It kind of felt like at any moment something could happen. The moments right before an action starts are the most exciting, also scary. It was a really long planning session. It's like obviously they can do these things and they can overstep us. They can do that and they're doing it. What we're gonna do now is the bigger question. We need to move forward. We didn't know what to do, but people were like, we have to do something. Let's just go in to the president's office. We're just gonna do it. We went in. 40 or so people, maybe more. Lawrence! Lawrence! More people! More people! Lawrence! Lawrence! The secretary tried to say, don't go in there, but, you know, there was 40 of us. Jamshed wasn't there. We, the students of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art, can no longer uphold or endorse the direction our college has taken under the leadership of Jamshed Barucha. By voting no confidence today, join us in keeping Cooper Union free to all. I do have a statement to read to you. First, let me say, I'd rather you just leave. 
Students and others currently engaged in a sit-in of the President's suite are trespassing. We're going to give a one-hour period for anyone to leave. Anyone remaining on the seventh floor after that one-hour period will be subject to disciplinary action. At some point, they are going to have to try and remove us. And there's two or three other men. There was a very bad situation in the lobby, uh, and the police did get called. I have removed the additional security guards. The police are also standing down. For many of us, it was the first time being in the president's office. We have like this red light <laughs> that we show to say that we're occupying the space. It's like being in a submarine. It's like a shared experience and it's hard to sleep because there was all this energy. There is some physicality of having to be there, actually having to abstain from your normal life and that's very powerful. This space of the action is also this great opportunity to have no one imposing structures on us. And this is really not asking permission and unapologetic. Just, we're not sorry. So I guess you can tell, I'm, this is a few years ago. Um, but like Casey said, actually, we benefited tremendously from the help of many local community organizers. Many of them were student organizers, uh, adjunct faculty organizers, student unions, uh, local political activists. Um, that this, uh, this actually was the second occupation of uh, Cooper within one year in that. And the occupation of the president's office lasted 65 days, which is two months in the middle of summer, but it followed um, a shorter occupation of uh, 10 days, which happened in December, in which I think it is good to mention we had an embedded uh, new school reporter uh, with us, along with, a, <laughs> along with the Cooper students. So it, there, was, there, there was a lot to be recognized since then about how, how um, dynamic of a collaboration this, this work was across just hundreds of people and many different types of groups intersecting. And the whole thing really played out in the media and online. So uh, just throughout, the New York Times was covering the story uh, kind of in a terrible way. Like the, on the left is an op-ed from a board member uh, basically saying free tuition is not the answer. And on the right, we were uh, basically parodying them at every step. So they, they were meanwhile writing an article. This was uh, based on the New York Public Library, which successfully uh, won against their board at that time to stop an expansion. So it said New York Public Library abandons plan to charge tuition. And, uh, we just kind of changed but the text and image. I think it, it, New York Public Library abandons plan to for a, uh, expansion. Oh, to remodel. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Um, but a lot of a lot of really poignant um, art and and content came out of this time. Uh, many of our peers uh, continued on to work all of this back into their practices, as did we. Um, I think most of us took it as an opportunity to continue figuring out and, and workshopping what had gone on at Cooper and to not let it uh, fall by the wayside. And there were many types of provocations that we thought could actually expand and broadcast out our message to be beyond that, to be beyond that of just keeping Cooper free um, and to really talk about the urgency for rethinking the way that institutions relate to students and faculty and employment and education. And in the middle of the occupation, uh, we graduated because it ran through the summer. So we went down to graduate and then went back up to 
continue occupying. And uh, the occupation ended in a negotiated agreement with the board. Um, and after school, uh, an, a group of alumni, Bruce High Quality, uh, who were at the time running a school in the East Village, basically allowed us to use their space uh, and under the guise of like teaching a class there. But basically we had about like six people come to a class at 6 p.m. vaguely about the concept of education. And then at 10 p.m. when classes got out at Cooper, we would have like 60 people come over and we would have these tactical meetings uh, basically every night for a semester. Oh yeah. And so that was actually a really interesting parallel to Cooper as well, which had which started off as a free night school. And so we thought we're a, we're a free night school following a free day school following a free class about education. <laughs> and then this was like the first time that we had really done something in in a space, not as students doing an action. So we were like <laughs> just having fun. <laughs> and also continuing to do these things that are very legibly protests. I think the space incubated a, a possibility for students to continue their work, but also not abandon the need to really be critical and let, let the decision to charge tuition pass while uh, the working group that Casey mentioned was, was meeting, but also simultaneously being sabotaged. This is from a Halloween action to levitate the foundation building. Which Sam actually. Oops. So all of that time was uh, time spent outside of the physical building, which obviously we think so much about, and it created this space where we really ha felt like being outside, physically outside of the school, we needed to re-examine and study and think about what we were talking about. And Casey did a had a long project that looked at the bylaws of the school. So th it was a time of, uh, basically, Victoria was actually on the official committee. And it was the first time that a group of alumni, students, faculty, would, uh, trustees, administrators would all come together to reassess what it would take to keep Cooper free. But as Vic mentioned, it was entirely sabotaged. And so there was really uh, not much to do except to continue doing these kinds of actions participate in every possible way, and then also try to keep thinking more deeply. So yeah, this was a mapping of the bylaws of the board, which governs how they run the institution. And there's about like 40 revisions from the 1800s to present. Um, and uh, yeah, this is actually out of date at this point, because following the, the past year of legal sort of shifts at Cooper, there's been another revision. So. And uh, simultaneously, uh, basically, the, the lawsuit reached uh, a conclusion, which was a negotiated agreement between a group of alumni and uh, the board that the attorney general stepped in and uh, basically set up provisions for 10 years of regulation for the college under which they're required to return to being free. So this was kind of seen as like an epic uh, precedent setting legal victory. And um, I think there's an element of simultaneity that we've come to embrace, but essentially during the times uh, during the times following our graduation and, and using this fellowship at this external space um, and participating uh, officially and unofficially in this working group setting with consultants and trustees, like Casey said, uh, there was, again, a growing fear that actually there was not a good faith effort being put forward by the board and the administration to follow through on the task of doing the due diligence needed to research the financial uh, options towards keeping the school free. And, and as a result of that, a group of um, alumni, faculty, uh, an incoming student, and an applicant brought forward a lawsuit, which Casey explained uh, was further taken up by the Attorney General and resulted in uh, a negotiation that settled out of court. We've actually brought a couple of the copies of that uh, document, if anyone wants to see them, the read. 
uh, is quite good because following what you saw in Ivory Tower, um, you know, the board maintained for years, as, uh, as many boards do act as one, maintained that all of the options had been exhausted, that, that the endowment was how it was, that the finances resulted from a very complicated set of situations that were compounding, but actually the Attorney General in a very short amount of time with, uh, was able to create a, a, not a narrative, but a telling of the story which very clearly demarcates how and when different uh, mistakes which were actually illegal on the part of the board uh, took place, which caused uh, a ripple effect, which ended up with the school charging tuition, uh, breaking its mission, and and all of those different uh, researchers into the bylaws and these these uh, governing documents of the of the school and of any school ended up being really relevant to this case. So, we launched a project sort of in conjunction with that announcement uh, called Nonstop Cooper, which was a we called it a community residency, and we took the word nonstop from Antioch and kind of reapplied it to say that um, Cooper never closed down in the way that Antioch did, but even in the absence of its mission, the community continued to workshop ways to, to not just return to free, but to expand on the meaning of free. and. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we began to rethink a lot of the different uh, rhetoric, language, visual language. Many of us wanted to return to different aspects of our practice, which had kind of been under uh, indefinite suspension during the time of like the the different actions. Significantly, this uh, this this community residency took place in the St. Mark's bookshop space, which many of you know used to be on um, the corner of St. Mark's and Third, which Cooper. Cooper's board uh, elected to push out in favor of trying to find a new tenant. And in the years since uh, St. Mark's Bookshop has been pushed out, um, the school has yet to find a new tenant that can pay. And as a result, the neighborhood is uh, at a loss for one more family-owned business that had been longstanding. And so the idea to bring community back into that space was just another rethinking of like what, uh, what, what kind of visual, physical occupancy could do to reflect back on that situation and that tension. And uh, we found ourselves basically facing burnout across the entire community and across basically the world. Like, not nowhere more so than at Cooper did people not want to talk about what was going on at Cooper. But also, the news cycle had kind of moved on. Like, we no longer really had a platform, and this was kind of like a post occupy moment where uh, it wasn't that we were getting all of these amazing resources and sending solidarity back to other actions going on around the world, but it would have been kind of laughable to do some of these um, more legible protest tactics. So that's where this kind of different image and a different approach came in. Um, and uh, we actually have some more <laughs> vines here. just to show a little bit of sort of what it <laughs> felt like. And so following that, uh, following that residency, the, the bookshop still remains um, without a tenant, without a permanent tenant, which, can, which leaves us, uh, the community, and, and I think Casey and myself, asking again why different actions were taken, why different measures how, how they impact not only our community, our cause, but the, the, broader, the broader situation. Um, this, this was a large meeting with the trustees in this space, um, and it shows kind of a fuller view of what can happen for lack of community space at many institutions. I know, I know it's a problem at Cooper, I know it's a problem <laughs> at New School, but the spaces for having this type of discourse, the way Peter Cooper imagined in the Great Hall, actually are in a huge deficit. And so we think a lot about the space that people and bodies can take um, in and around and outside of uh, institutions formally. I think this also relates to the sort of ideas that drew us to the prompt of post-democracy, because uh, Cooper's board actually hasn't done a great job of interacting with the community. But when they do, they would set up an event in such a way where you can't really have any kind of real or meaningful interaction. Like, basically, after a certain point, 
Um, they started to only interact at public events through like an, an index card system. So if you had a question, you would like write it down. They would select a question that they felt like answering and then speak the answer. So in some ways, uh, we created this multi-purpose space that was hosting classes. It was having like karaoke every night. Um, but also because it was a time where news was breaking about the lawsuit and the reshuffling of the governance, we had the opportunity to kind of slide in these discussions on our own terms. And it really did rankle the feathers of the board. Um, you can't tell from this image, but this was a pretty tense discussion where um, the trustees basically came into a space that the students had been hanging out in for a month and sort of dreaming about like what institutions could be and what the meaning of educational institutions is. And uh, a lot of this discussion was about, you know, things are how they are, you know, get over it, things aren't going to change, where everyone is doing the best we can. So I think it was in a time where it wasn't easy to have any kind of discussion, uh, a wake-up call about where, where things were at. Um, this was another sort of round table, and so we invited figures like the president of the college, and we did think tanks on different issues. This was just the window text. Um, it's actually available in some of the publications that are up there, but we thought how to translate the time uh, should really be reflected in words and writing and, and this kind of idea of like being twisted and waking up from a dream, um, keeping up with like a visual, a new type of visual feeling that, that, and the transparency of the window as well. And just thinking of a way to utilize the space since we were gonna be there so for such a short time. All of this, thinking about properties and space and leases uh, just further reminded us and underscored so much of the poignancy about the building of the new building, which wasn't the sole, wasn't the sole cause for the charging of tuition, but really exacerbated um, the situation with the school's endowment. Um, and so we pulled up some photos of the previous President George Campbell um, showing, showing off and debuting the, the new model for this uh, new academic building, which is, on, which is right on uh, 7th and 3rd. Um, and, and so we started to think, too, like going beyond this kind of nonstop language, which was twisting the sort of symbols of Cooper and giving them sort of um, like sorbet colors and uh, wiggles, just going deeper and deeper into these kind of elements that we could repurpose because all of the language and all of the imagery felt like it got stuck on that free education to all banner and it, it really didn't uh, rile people up in a way that was relevant to doing something in the present time. So this is a New York Times article about the quarry that the, the foundation building is built from, uh, which actually closed in 2012 because the quarry had just been mined completely out. Um, so it became a water park after this point. I think we've, we've thought a lot about uh, what's, I think, the materiality of buildings, the stark contrast between really artificially made glass and metal buildings, the, the history of the roll, the uh, steel that, P that Peter Cooper helped invent, and also this kind of extractive resource, such as like the brownstone, which is such a, such a like landmarked uh, visual identity of New York City, but also is this, is a resource that can be completely uh, exhausted and to think that so nearby this resource was not only exhausted and uh, I guess what's interesting is that the facade of the foundation building which is made of the this brownstone is a landmarked uh, facade um, there's a plaque on the back of the foundation building which reads uh, about all of the accomplishments of the school which led to it being landmarked and similarly at this uh, quarry site it, it's also a landmarked space and we began to think about the positive and negative attributes of um, a hole in the ground and a positive building and what remains of a resource once it's depleted and that began a whole new uh, inquiry into like this type of visual what we call the quarry and the anti-quarry um, and to think about people and bodies and, and resources and people as being uh, a foundation or a mine um, and kind of really 
looking into some new language for how we could talk about what it would mean to do durational types of organizing across different uh, ways of thinking. This was um, from, I think, the 70s. They completely gutted the building. And it was redesigned by John Haydick, who used to be the dean of the architecture school for many years. Um, going back to the point about the landmark, it's another thing that it took us kind of years to, to stumble upon was this weird fact that like the Peter Cooper had endowed a building, not a program. So really, he put out an open call to say, I'd like to found some kind of institution. What should go in here? And uh, a women's school of art was one of the first to apply. But a lot of groups at the time had applied. I think the Met Museum wanted some space. And the Cooper Hewitt Museum was in there for many years. Um, so this is just a, a kind of shocking thought that this building could, uh, it, it hasn't always been what it's known for today. And it could be something completely different. So it was a moment where we, that we come back to as a way to think about how the school has no real fixed identity and could really be anything. This is the website. Oh, yeah. And so I think, <laughs> I think we're actually, uh, our presentation is kind of drawing a bit to a close because we're coming back to present day. But we wanted to share some of our more recent thinking because we've clearly gone deep into the past and then also to the not so, not so distant past. But um, in the past year, we've also been uh, continuing along this line of inquiry. And most recently, we were approached by the Alumni Association of the school, which I think we're officially members of just by virtue of having graduated, but not formal members. Um, and we were asked to throw the school's uh, third annual block party. So not really a time-honored tradition, but something, something that would be public and something that could commemorate the moment. And it really struck us as an opportunity to exercise a few liberties in throwing all of these concepts and all of the work of the community and all of these different different and neighboring community groups into one block party. Um, and I think we're going to just show uh, part of the website that we made that kind of runs through a lot of what we've talked about, but in maybe a more poetic way. I think that is also kind of a good indication of where we're at coming from these really um, intense protests that were also intensely legible to uh, these more social, recreational, mixed spaces and events. And uh, I think Vic was saying that like we took the opportunity of the block party to try to essentially make the party about construction and real estate redevelopment and uh, what's going on at Cooper. But it didn't have to be that way. And uh, when we were first invited, I was actually like really offended that it would seem what the possibilities are for Cooper has come to like throwing a party. It seemed uh, like it would, it seems like there's no efficacy there at all. Um, and so I think that's something that we're trying to think about, which is how to look at what the opportunities that are currently available are and uh, build in these concepts. And in many ways, the opposite is true, that actually these types of events, which are kind of mixed use, create a, an inclusive place for people to come back in after, a, after what was ultimately a very traumatic series of events for many generations of people who supported, went to, lived around uh, the Cooper area. And so in the end, we were able to, with a lot, a lot of help, uh, create a, a pretty dynamic set of programming for what, 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 what is typically just kind of a street fair, um, but for the past three years has been headed by different alumni trying to bring kind of in a similar vein, just many, uh, I guess what we refer to as points of public record about where the school is at, how people can get involved, um, bringing people up to date with the findings of the lawsuit, uh, helping new students and parents find information about what has actually transpired, uh, what the state of things are, uh, how new, new hires and the presidential search can Im will impact their educations, uh, what happens to them after they graduate, um, and really leaning upon a lot of the internal resources of the school, be it from the archives to faculty to alumni, newspapers, student clubs, really a lot of stuff. Um, 
And I think a big part of what we haven't quite hit on so much is this kind of constant state of redevelopment that not only the city and not only Cooper, but just so much of an infrastructure-led society is kind of in a constant cycle of and how disorienting that can be and how in the midst of all of what's happened, we, we ourselves kind of elected to, to lean on these ideas of disorientation but that actually there's there's an ample amount going on all around us, and so I think for this event we decided to look back out instead of uh, instead of being the disorienting factor ourselves, but try and see what are these different changes that have happened by breaking the ground and by having this ground around Astor Place be constantly broken for really the larger part of 10 years, um, and having it be redeveloped for renderings essentially not not even real people. What what impact that has on a on a shared community or like a, a, actually the crux of many different types of communities. And so embedded in here are actually, um, and the website is petercooperblockparty.com if anyone wants to see, but there are just many different uh, uh, collections of images um, from our librarian who's documented the changes for like the past many years um, and you can really see a story that you wouldn't see otherwise. It's not really told through the press or the media. It's told like through the, the vantage point of someone who comes to a place every day. Um. We also pulled in uh, more of these kind of unexpected uses of the space. This is a remaking of an Alan Caprow piece about um, melting ice that was constructed a bunch of years ago. This was actually made while I was a freshman, and it was uh, as the that new building that I said made out of all these artificial materials was being made. Um, the faculty who was in charge of this class had these students recreate that work in an effort to make a statement about um, just like the artificiality and and, and resource based building why and and asking some some questions early on. This is David Hammond selling snowballs like any other vendor on St. Mark's. <laughs> And these are skateboarders that immediately took to the new building and the administration immediately put up a bunch of crap so that they can't skateboard there. And so we've kind of returned to that initial image uh, that we saw the video of in the beginning, which is actually an 1871 uh, engraving that sits in a plaque inside of the, um, the public lobby of the foundation building. And if any of you go to the library ever, um, you will see this large, large ornate plaque outside the library, uh, which is filled with um, different calligraphy about the history uh, and the nature of the school. And in, in the very center is a very small engraving that was made by an artist collective of students uh, from print make, that were in printmaking in 1871, which depicts the back of the foundation building, right the site of the block party as well. And uh, we were kind of shocked to see that even in 1871, these kind of rendered images, these ghostly, shadowy figures were kind of depicted. It was still uh, a bus lane, but right in the center were these two women walking and one in the most magnificent blue. You, if you see it in person, it's just this stunning blue. And we began to think if we thought back 200 years 150 years to when the school was just opening and imagined ourselves in the places of these women, thinking 200 years in the future might be a good way to situate ourselves going forward. There's, there's basically parallel processes going on at Cooper right now to try to articulate the mission and um, the strategy of the institution. And uh, it's the kind of question where when someone asks you, it's really impossible to think of anything, which is like, it, it's just so straightforward. So I think that's where th there's not really any possibility on that level to activate people's imaginations. And that's where I think a lot of our work is, is trying to come in right now. So I'm actually almost at the bottom of this, <laughs> this page. <laughs> But at the very bottom, uh, we began to think about kind of, again, the material, the immaterial, the digital, the, the unreal. And we kind of put ourselves and some of the other block party organizers in a, a virtual brownstone quarry. Um, and we kind of had an open invitation for people to join us here in this, in this brownstone quarry that's not yet a water park. We even threw in Peter Cooper.
So I think we only just have a few more photos just of the block party itself, and then we'd love to talk more with you uh, if there's questions and um, about the publications we've brought and and our future events are going to be like Karen said uh, really encounters they're not going to be presentations like this but we wanted to we wanted to give everyone a chance to get to know where we're coming from uh, as the future events probably won't uh, really they won't not acknowledge <laughs> any of this but they will not uh, spend the time going through this we'll try and make it accessible to the new school community and to anyone who's following um, but we wanted to take the second to have a kind of public event where we named these different facets that led us here and led us to think with many of our friends and collaborators to apply to this fellowship at all, um, let alone to receive it and to be in the position to conceive of a two-year arc of uh, programming and content and developing ideas. Um, so in, a, in an interesting twist, we returned to the empty bookshop space after the block party. Um, we were allowed to use the space uh, by the administration, and we wanted to think again about how, since we didn't have a month this time, we really had six hours, how to fill the space, and we constructed an inflatable, uh, air-filled version of the foundation building um, for the students to dance in uh, that could be easily taken away or just kind of float away. Um, and again, that space is still not yet leased out. The big yellow book that you saw too was something that we produced for the block party and I think it, it relates and to a lot of what we've talked about and builds on it because we came to the question of how to integrate information into an event like this or a sense of asking or answering the question of what's going on here, which is actually plastered all around on construction sites. Um, but it's kind of a situation right now where the straightforward approaches are not cutting it. And so really no one wants to hear anyone uh, say anything about anything. So we collated an entire year of public documentation, whether that means emails or board minutes or um, images of the construction and redevelopment. and. Uh, in the end, it was edited down to about 400 pages from 1,000. So uh, we kind of released this informational tome with no commentary. And uh, other than that, it was largely just uh, a party. <laughs> I think that leads us to uh, something that is happening in parallel to our fellowship here. Um, and. Uh, it's a class that we're going to be co-teaching um, at Cooper Union with, uh, I didn't actually have you while I was at school, but our professor, Wally Broad, um, who was also a Verilist uh, fellow. Um, and we w wanted to share with you, because I think it parallels some of the language uh, in our application from the previous year, the course description for this class, which is called Projects, the Cooper Union. Do you want to read it? Sure. Unfolding events in the Cooper Union are generating expected and unexpected sounds, images, forms, volumes, gestures, feelings, and concepts. In this class, we will attend, as in wait for and stretch toward some of these. As such, we misunderstand the Cooper Union as a proposition constituted by and constituting missions, properties, bodies, languages, figures, among others. We engage chronologies that may not settle, numbers that may not add up, bodies that come and go. <laughs> and so we'll be figuring out how to make different parts of that hopefully accessible, either via documentation or via collaboration with our fellowship um, as they tend to deal with a lot of the same subject matter. We actually uh, weren't even trying to t-shirt class, really. We basically wanted to uh, meet with Walid and propose a kind of secret or kind of back end like think tank. Like it's at this point a process of constantly trying to assess where everyone is at, what's possible, if anyone thinks anything is possible. Um, and it kind of morphed into this class, but it seems to be a good format for asking these questions and carving out the time and space to work on them. Uh, something that we talked about was that like, it's a pretty specific thing to want to think about Cooper Union and uh, when you could just have classes to think about your own practice. I think a lot of people 
in the time that I was in school felt like the education had been kind of taken away from them by the turmoil. Um, and so at this point, I think we're trying to propose that they're not necessarily a split, but actually there could be a way to integrate them and to make those kinds of questions interrelated with existing practices. I think that's our last slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, both um, very, very much. I think you all have a sense now of just how incredibly important this project is for an institution like ours. And I feel really, really lucky um, to be provoked in our daily work through your presence and through these questions that to me are um, interesting on many, many different accounts. One of them is the constant reference to a physical environment, whether it's the, the, the architect of the building, that for the block part, you completely reverse the inside and the outside. And I don't know if anyone was there, but who is here now, but the uh, parts of the archive and the library ended up on being on the sidewalk during this um, Saturday, sunny uh, summer day. It was kind of amazing. And just now, this last um, description of the class speaks of bodies coming and going. So um, I would have questions along those lines of you know, physicality, of experience and history. But I really um, would love to hear from you and uh, hear your questions so that we can uh, take advantage of Casey and Victoria's presence here for a little longer. We're also videotaping everything, so um, whatever has been said and will be said from here on in will be available on our website and we'll share it with classes. And so the questions you're posing, um, you're posing them as much to, to uh, Victoria and Casey as you know, to the students who will see these videos. So. And if you don't mind getting a microphone or could you have, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Must I stand up here? <laughs> no, 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 just so um, we can hear it. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question about, actually this, this slide is a good uh, sample for my question. Uh, looking through this briefly before the talk and seeing things like this, it seems like you're using uh, language in a particular way and um, creating this kind of feeling of, uh, I don't know, disarray and sort of non, you know, nonsense or, you know, whatever, something like that. Can you talk about that, what that has, how that connects with the other stuff you, you've already said? Um, so th I think like, this slide does probably speak to your question. Um, I think we've we've begun to think about, um, and also the class description as well, a lot of different timelines being overlapped, a lot of um, threads being pulled, and in terms of a visual, a visual language, something, something along the lines of many, many things being coterminous and sharing, sharing the same space for a constant rethinking. I think a, perhaps a more straightforward application of, um, of this, is that pink and yellow book. Uh, and I do have some copies on the table over there. I, we have, oh, here too. Um, and fortunately I have, I, I might actually have enough for anyone who's interested tonight, um, just what we could schlep from Brooklyn. But in essence, we tried to apply this type of sense and nonsense like you're saying into um, documents that we thought could inform each other by being by sharing a physical space, uh, though they do, they weren't necessarily sourced from any one place or time. And so, similarly, when it comes to language or visuals, we've been thinking about where to pull in and how to abstract and twist different pre-existing uh, languages. I think for this first little book, um, we thought of it these these being reflections on Cooper, Casey and I have started to call this a preflection on the Verilla Center, um, being something that I think will be informed by the the future events and the and the different programming that we'll be working on. So we thought to just kind of put a lot of it in here as a way of um, marking a time when we were thinking a lot of things. And I can't say whether it will become more streamlined, but I have a feeling that some of those things will stick and some won't. But 
for us, it's been very meaningful to put it all uh, together and work reductively, I think. Maybe that's a counter, maybe that's a knee-jerk reaction to um, some of these experiences in which uh, retroactively narratives have been um, condensed either by press or media or administrations in a situation where you kind of lose the agency to say, I, I thought, I felt this way, I thought this way, I knew that this was the case, and so I think we're using these all as a way of saying these were thoughts from this time, these were feelings from this time, and they can't be eradicated or taken back um, because they were there. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> I think also on the question of, oh, sorry. Oh, no, different. No, no, oh, sorry. oh, just on the question of like disarray and nonsense, it reminded me of like a book that um, I was reading at the time that we were doing a lot of those actions. and. I mostly love the title, but it's like, Ken Jokes Take Down Government. And I think that's, it's just stuck with me forever because I think that is kind of like, it's basically a linguistic trap um, when you are dealing with bureaucracies and with this legal action. So much of it comes down to interpretations of texts that don't even exist in a world where they could possibly mean the same thing. So the lawsuit, at Cooper was really about scrutinizing the founding charter, about a day school and a night school, and trying to draw out this super, super specific, irrelevant meaning. And they ended up winning, but almost not for the right reason. So I think there's also so many, there's such a strong desire to say, like, is the money there? What, what happened? What are the facts and figures? And I think that's where, for the class, we're trying even though every day we get to know a little bit more, to get back to a place of unknowing and uh, not relying on those things. And instead, basically, any time that we're confronted with something that makes sense to like run away or try to scramble it. Yes, uh, uh, good evening. Thanks a lot for the presentation and the material. It's extremely stimulating. I have a question that relates to the title of the Verilis Center project, which was in post-democracy, and you started with checking, I mean, you explained the, the, the process that led you uh, uh, thinking of the Cooper Union adventure, misadventure, as an illustration of post-democracy. And kind of at the end of this expose, then I somehow wonder whether the theme of post-democracy is still, uh, how, do, how does it fit? Because you know, when you speak about the project, about the sounds, the forms, the values, the feelings, etc., uh, I wonder how you manage to carry this checklist of non-transparency, the fact that you, know, you have those consulting bodies making decisions, and, and, and this is very strong in the beginning of your presentation with Occupy Wall Street, the Antioch, etc. So, how do you manage to bring this theme of uh, post-democracy in this more kaleidoscopic quality of the project, the way I perceive it? Uh, and maybe it's a non nice question, but do you feel uh, impeded by the theme of post-democracy to carry your project? Or how, how do you bring those two things together? But congratulations, great stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's where like, we actually added that subtitle of Paradise Lost. And that came like maybe eight, eight or 10 months or something into this fellowship. But we had been using the word post-democracy kind of around Cooper and with people that we work with. And uh, it, parts of it would stick or not stick. And we were trying to feel out all the different dimensions. There's a little bit in the book, uh, the square book about it. But trying to figure out like, is post-democracy only big and serious? Or could it apply to any? anything at any scale and uh, is it is it interesting is it relevant like do people is it something we can work with and uh, I think it, it relates to the previous question too about having to scramble it where I think we're um, we're almost uh, reorienting it to to be the two in combination the post-democracy and the paradise lost I think also uh, this event is a good um, a good time for us to kind of uh, being on the heel of, of some future events 
set, set out a place for for people to follow along on our developments. But one of the things we're interested in doing is uh, publicizing our application, which was only on the screen for a second. But uh, many of those qualities you described that were an initial draw in the in the very straightforward read of post democracy. What's so interesting is that as time progresses, they 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 still envelop the school. So these aspects of non transparency, even though uh, say a lot of the caustic nature and the the aggressor situation is kind of subsided. The the qualities that would constitute a post democratic state are still very present, and it's something that you know, as an institution within a network of institutions within a, a very large country, it's like all of these things stack, and so it's not a state of exception. I think for us, it's like it's specifically not a state of exception. It's a state of a abundant post-democracy everywhere, but but I think we thought in the application process um, in the same way that, in the same vein as how we thought during the student debt crisis that there's a specific lens with which Cooper could be used uh, to make a case for what, what that really means uh, tangibly for other institutions uh, or other communities or education in general. Um, this might also speak a little more to the abstraction of it again, but we uh, we tend to call it a, we joke with Karen and everyone, we actually have shortened it to Podemo, uh, which means we can, <laughs> and uh, Paradise Lost to uh, Para Los, which in Spanish means like for them. So it's kind of, we're considering, we're, we're kind of considering more what those things could mean, but um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe also if I could just add that post-democracy you know, also refers to the key question of representation and whether it can happen through other ways than electoral politics. And you know, that's where social media and works uh, like yours come in. You had a question? I just, you know, this is something I grapple with. Coming from uh, Canada, I work here at the New School. Um, and in Canada, all our post-secondary education is public, not free as it should be, but um, but here at a private university, and Cooper is a private, right? Um, I wonder, <laughs> and this is a genuine question, w w what sense it makes to talk about private universities in the context of any kind of po democracy, right? Um, post or pre or explicitly anti. Um, so I'm just interested in w how you're thinking about private institutions in relation to democracy post, pre, or actual. I, I think we actually cut it a bit out of this presentation, but interestingly, um, Cooper was founded uh, again in 1859 before there was actually this uh, this language differentiating between public and private institutions and being uh, being in the 1850s, which actually I think, I'm not sure whether we mentioned, but Antioch College, which is also private, the one we were referring to in Ohio, there were there was this great kind of resurgence in the 1850s of um, people who were trying to endow colleges, specifically uh, aiming towards underrepresented groups uh, in the fields of education, which was previously really with a withheld right for uh, white affluent men who could afford to go. And this kind of the advent of public education and public colleges. Uh, comes afterwards in, in, in a sense of time. And something I think along the lines of your question that we also think about a lot are aspects of accreditation, right? Um, so whether or not, and, and in these many years we've been dealing not only with New School, NYU, CUNY, and many other uh, local colleges, but also some of these kind of satellite groups and other, uh, other programs which are either uh, private or public, and in Cooper's case, because it was, uh, we also kind of skipped over this, but part of the reason why uh, Cooper was free for so long was because Peter Cooper had endowed the college uh, via a very savvy um, kind of mixed plan of like a, an actual endowment, land-based endowments, which included um, the land under the Chrysler building, which was meant to, and at the time he was uh, kind of having this great debate with other, with Andrew Carnegie and uh, with a lot of other people who were beginning to found universities about why school should be uh, free. And uh, there's, there's some really interesting historical documents there, but I think in terms of uh, timing, it's like 
Cooper kind of sits at this intersection of like a free private school, which kind of, I don't know, that is, I don't think that answers your question, but I think the, the necessity to maintain a narrative of the possibility of that happening speaks to, um, dovetails with this idea of a kind of bankruptcy of the, the public higher education system, which has happened under like many previous presidencies, right? So it's like they're, they're complementary networks, but the fact that um, the media was able to tackle what happened at Cooper in such a specific way, such as to say that this is an uh, antiquated model, it's, an, it's, it's a system that was, it's old, it could only work in this one situation was really a falsehood that in many ways is only, the, the details of which have only been detailed in the Attorney General's findings. So in this very specific thing that's only available online, which was not, I don't believe, has been that widely read. I think maybe it's, uh, it's probably was like a headline once. And so that kind of finding, I think, is, that's really what's at stake, is this misunderstanding about the, the tension between public and private institutions and like how, how many different governing bodies within and above these institutions kind of create, create and manifest this misunderstanding. So first, on a, just on a very personal note, at a visceral level, your presentation for me as a veteran of one of those sit-ins at a university many years ago, at a visceral level, uh, your presentation and your work is amazing, is awesome. And I haven't had a lot of the, that visceral sense in many years. And so I would urge you to keep that part in in future presentations. It's an important element for, especially for those of us that like to remember those times. This, the question I have for you is how you think about personhood or agency or whatever word you want to use about whatever terminology works for you in the midst of all of this. You, you've danced around it a bit, and I'm just curious both how you think about it and how that will feature in in the future as you're moving the project forward. Yeah, I think um, it's funny. We always talk about like this word institutional personhood, but then it's another thing that we cut out because it's this fear that it makes no sense or something. But uh, I think a lot of it comes down to that question of agency and even um, even when you're consulted for an opinion or you're part of a decision-making process, if it means anything to be part of it. I think that's sort of the post-democratic aspect, which is that you can have a system that functions on paper and in real life to no effect. Like the, the university continues on at Roski with no students. I'm like, it's kind of the same at Cooper where I'm like, ostensibly it's on the path back to free. Um, it reads as such, but I think when you're there on the ground, uh, it doesn't really feel like that's, that's gonna happen without really galvanizing people, I think in a way that's a lot less connected to that kind of visceral connection to a protest or some kind of mass collective action. And so that's the challenge for me, which is to imagine what agency looks like in a way that's not nostalgic for um, those moments where everyone came together before having really conceived of how complexly entangled the financial and the social and the political uh, aspects of this institution are. I think it's, um, it's basically the core of it for me and I think the hard part is that it might not look like what uh, what gets your heart pumping, you know? Like that's, I think, the danger of showing some of those things. I think the question of personhood is a very good one because I think in having, uh, realistically, having come into this as young students and now not, not being that much older, but working, continuing to work with students um, through really the high school level, applying students, so like, 16 and 17 year olds all the way uh, through people our age mid, in their mid-20s to alumni that are a few generations older or faculty. Um, the questions of personhood 
didn't, I think, in the time of the actions, didn't seem as present because there was a different type of urgency which masked the, masked the fact that we were all being overlooked in one certain way. And in the years since, there's been huge, huge, like hugely pressing um, efforts amongst not only, obviously not only within the Cooper community, but to really address this idea of personhood as being, as lagging, I would say, and as being comp even in a progressive university, like progressive and private university like Cooper's, to really address issues of race, class, and gender for which the school was founded to address in the first place. And But that type of reassessment um, comes comes across in different ways. I mean, this is not something, because we are, we're alumni, it's not something that we were involved with, but last year, um, a group of transgender students essentially had to uh, campaign and take just a, a, exorbitant amounts of time and effort in and outside of class to make a point about the lack of available public restrooms for them, right? And I, this is also like, it's not, it's uh, this, I, this word of inter term of intersectionality and this is like in solidarity with things like what was going on with Black Lives Matter and there was a lot that was fomenting out of these things and the, the path that they took to address a lack of personhood within the institution has, I think, retroactively informed a lot of the type of language that, um, that, that we and the people we work with are want to use because it was in a sense absent during like I would say 2011, 2012, not that it was any less pressing then, but that the lack of dialogue around that because of these different false urgencies uh, created a situation where that was just not part of the language and where it's now very uh, present, though not resolved. Maybe one last question, that would Sorry. be great. <laughs> um, so, so much of your time has been spent specifically on Cooper, but then also a little more tangentially with an education, Antioch and USC. And it almost seems like Cooper has become a really successful model for all of these ideas you guys have about um, architecture, real estate, institutional space, and the disenfranchisement that can happen under these things. But this model that you guys have built, it seems like it could be pretty easily transposed onto so many other issues. And I'm wondering if that's sort of like bubbling with you guys already, you know, because so much has been unpacked with Cooper with you guys. And I'm wondering, like, I guess I'm asking the next step in a way. I think that's one of the things that we've been grappling with um, so far throughout the fellowship and in discussions with Karen and everyone, um, which is to push beyond the kind of immediate connections between Cooper and other institutions. Like, one of the first thoughts was to, like, uh, embed in the newspaper or to sit in the cafeteria and, like, try to solicit, like, discussions or something, or um, even to think about, like, the buildings that we, that are so similar. But I think, like, something that we've been kind of challenging ourselves to do and unable to unable to not do is to basically say what what goes beyond those obvious visible connections and and uh, the idea that that Cooper could just kind of what we've learned could transfer anywhere like I think we've been trying to get deeper and deeper into things that feel so local that they couldn't possibly be understood um, outside of this one block but also I think have some different element that is that would resonate with kind of someone else. I think that was what brought us to Antioch too and to Roski. It it has less to do with the fact that they're all in debt and they all have like governance problems or that like we have things to teach each other about like protest or something. Like it was actually just uh, the feeling of being there. It's kind of like an emotional. Um, it is like a different kind of visceral sort of sense, and uh, that seems to me to be a more open way of considering the connections between the institutions, but it's also a lot harder to pin down, I think, than to say, like, we both have big buildings. I think, uh, I think just really quickly, I'm like, I th it's so interesting, your question, because I think it's, it is definitely a very present concern for us whether or not 
you know, we stay in education or higher education or higher arts education or, uh, you know, even consider tertiary arts education and a lot of these different related um, adjacent or not adjacent issues. And I think for us, we're, uh, part of our application was that there's there's something unresolved about what's what's happened, our own experience, that of our collaborators, our our faculty, our friends, and it's a it's a really slow stewardship, I would say, and it's part of that idea of like this kind of nonstop effort because, in essence, so much of uh, what I was trying to explain as continually post democratic situation, the school isn't necessarily righted as a result of. Um, this this attorney general investigation, or and we're, nor are we any closer to going back to free or be becoming an institution that could be pivotal in moving other institutions in that direction. So I think for us, it's uh, it's a it's a bit about constant assessment as to whether or not that type of work is completed or is self evident or can has its own legs enough to to take on a life of its own without. Uh, continued effort. So I'm not. I don't think we ourselves know when it's over, but it's. It seems. It seems still uh, tangible to me that there's things to work on before. Or I. I also think like the opportunities kind of uh, develop themselves also, and so maybe that's a way of saying they're kind of organic. But yeah, I'm not sure. I don't exactly know what the next. Uh, the next thing is. I think you've also been remarkably um, precise in not simply duplicating an experience that you had at Cooper here or transferring or making assumptions about how it could be transferred, but using tools of communications very, very deliberately. And the range of um, media that you're applying to this investigation that takes you to similar situations at other institutions is really remarkable from tonight's talk to um, websites to this incredible output of printed matter to what I really consider a, a completely sculptural process um, and each avenue you know carves out one aspect of the Cooper Union issue. Um, I am sorry to say I think our time is up um, but do come back on October 6th when you will have this conversation with Jeffrey Scudder who's uh, drawing is on the cover of the program and um, by all means you know um, hang out a little longer with us but I think we'll uh, turn off the the microphones and um, thank you again very much for coming